Thank you, Laura, so much. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce you today to Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Did I say that correctly, Dr. Gleb? You did, you did. <laughs> so Dr. Gleb helps leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. Um, he serves as a CEO of the Future of Work Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb wrote the first book on returning to the office and leading hybrid teams after the pandemic. His first seller, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams um, Under uh, Intentional Sites. He authored seven books in total and is best known for his global bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. His cutting-edge thought leadership was featured in over 650 articles and 550 interviews in Harvard Business Review, Forbes Magazine, USA Today, CBS News, Fox News, Time, Business Insider, Fortune, The New York Times, and elsewhere. His writing was translated into Chinese, Spanish, Russian, Polish, Korean, French, Vietnamese, German, and other languages. His expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training for Fortune 500 companies from Aflac to Xerox. It also comes from over 15 years in academia as a behavioral scientist, with eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill, and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. A proud Ukrainian-American, Dr. Gleb lives in Columbus, Ohio. So everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Ben. Over Thank you. you very much for that kind introduction. Really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about how you can defeat the four horsemen of the mandated return to office. And this is a really difficult issue that folks in Southern Texas and around the United States are dealing with right now. There are a variety of efforts to return people to the office, whether it's for one day, two days, three days, four days, or in five days. And there are a variety of challenges that people who are working on the return to office mandates are facing. You as HR professionals are kind of stuck in the middle, and that's what I'm finding. So I helped 24 companies figure out their future of work strategies, and most of them have chosen a hybrid model, so they have returned to office. I think 22 of them chose a hybrid model that I consulted with them on. And so we've had to work on overcoming the challenges associated with the return to office. And what I've seen, I usually work with the HR function when I consult with them. I've seen the HR professionals and compensation professionals be stuck in the middle between the top leadership who wants to mandate more in office time and employees who want to have less in office time. And that's a big struggle. And so what we I want to do right now is talk about how you, as folks in the human resources and compensation position, can address and ameliorate the problems that are typically seen with the return to office. OK, so there are four problems, as you get it from the title. Resistance, attrition, quite quitting, and loss of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We'll take each of these in turn. And first, I want to talk about some case studies. So the first of the four horsemen of the mandated return to office, oh, I should say the four horsemen phrase, that actually came from a client of mine that was already in, in August, I believe. Yeah, August of 2021, when we had the vaccines and the return to office. And we already saw resistance to returning to the office that I was helping my client with. And my client said, well, these are kind of like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the mandated return to office, the four problems that we were seeing. And I said, oh, that's great. Can I steal that and use it elsewhere? And she said, sure. So now I'm using it elsewhere. So the first of the four horsemen is resistance. And one cautionary tale here to think about is GM, because resistance comes in two flavors. One is public and one is more internal to the company. So let's talk about the public. So GM announced on a Friday, a back to office plan of three days a week after previously having a pretty flexible schedule. And it got intense backlash over the weekend. By Tuesday, the CEO, Mary Barra, rolled back the plans. And as a result, the credibility of its return to office plan was 
very much undermined. So that was a big, big problem, of course, for GM. The credibility undermining, the rolling back, you don't want to do that. And of course, we see another example with Apple. So Apple, unlike a sudden announcement like GM did, had more gradual announcement. It's from the very beginning, it said it would mandate three days a week once the pandemic ended, and it was kind of slowly getting into the three days a week modality. And though Apple employees are known to be compliant and loyal, they still faced a major backlash. Over a thousand employees signed a petition asking for more flexibility. And of course, these aren't the only examples. We're seeing the same things happen at Starbucks, resistance, public resistance. We're seeing the same things happen at Amazon, where nearly a thousand employees walked out on the day that Amazon had the first return to office day. So we still, we're seeing a lot of public resistance. But we're also seeing private resistance internal to the company, non-compliance. So firms that mandate the return to office, I've seen high rates of non-compliance, up to 50% of employees at my clients, and also that's what external surveys are showing. Some employees just don't come to the office and they dare employers to do anything about them. Some come in one or two days when three days are required, and that's why you're seeing some companies saying being more stringent about this, although that might not be the right move. Some come in for three days a week if that's required, but they only come in for an hour or two for a meeting that's scheduled and then they go back home. And many managers refuse to discipline employees for such non-compliance. So I was talking to a CHRO a week ago of a major Fortune 200 company where she kind of lost the battle in the boardroom about mandating a return to the office where she was kind of up against a number of other executives and she wanted to have more flexibility. They wanted to have three days a week in the office. She lost that battle. And she was telling me that, hey, you know, she didn't feel like being <laughs> compliant herself with this degree, coming back to the office three days a week. And she was not really keen on punishing people who were <laughs> non-compliant. And so we see this in surveys, right? It's not only people who talk to me and who I see within my clients who have trouble punishing people for non-compliance. Only 3% of companies fire non-compliant employees and 30% have HR talk to them. And that's according to a survey by Gartner, which is a well-known HR company. 42% of bosses are simply ignoring defined employees. 14% issue verbal reprimands, 10% give negative performance reviews, and 15% reduce pay. Only 12% threaten termination, and as we see, something like 3% actually go through with it. And that's a sur survey of company leaders by Stanford University. Non-compliance with my clients. So what did my clients do? Some ignored non-compliant employees who weren't in management roles. Some issued verbal reprimands, some reduced pay, but none did something like issuing negative performance reviews or terminating employees. Okay, and so that's... Uh, the, uh, that's the challenge with the resistance. And I'm curious what you've seen around this. So you should be seeing a poll right now where you can vote on how much of a problem resistance poses for your workplace in relation to a mandated return to office. So please go ahead and vote. It's not a problem, moderate problem, serious problem, or not applicable. See most people participated. We'll give five more seconds. Okay, everyone did perfect. Okay, so about a fifth of you don't have any mandated days in the office. Cool, and it's not a problem for about a fifth of you, but for others, it's either a moderate problem for a third or for a fifth, it's a serious problem. So you're seeing for over half of you, it's either a moderate or a serious problem. So it's good to know, and good for you to be aware, and of course. This talk will give you the tools to know how to address this problem. The second horseman is attrition. So Apple, GM, others, Amazon, Lyft, Starbucks, Disney are facing serious challenges with attrition and even at the highest level. So for example, Apple's head of AI, Ian Goodfellow, he quit his position so really due to the lack of flexibility. He sent an email to staff about his departure that stated, quote, 
I believe strongly that more flexibility would have been the best policy for my team, unquote. So that's very important. You know how hot and important AI is. And that actually was pretty bad for Apple that it's head of AI quit. And we're seeing the same thing in other companies. So what does the data say? There was a study by Stanford University at trip.com, which is a major travel agency. So this is a randomized control trial where they randomly assigned half of the employees to a traditional schedule with no flexibility, nine for five, Monday for Friday. The other half to a significant flexibility to work remotely part-time. Those who had significant flexibility, so had at least some remote days, had 35% better retention over six months. 35% better retention. Now, you are in the human resource and compensation space. You know how hard it is, even with great compensation, to have higher retention. And this is 35% better flexibility. I mean, talk about compensation, right? So you're compensating people with flexibility, you're getting huge retention bonus. That is incredibly high. So when you're thinking about, as a compensation professional, what you can do to make sure that people stay, which is, of course, an important goal of compensation, or to recruit people, which is another goal of compensation, flexibility is a very important, very important driver of actual retention and recruitment. So after the trial, trip.com changed all staff to have significant flexibility. They're not done. <laughs> How many days works best? So there's a study by Harvard Business School at a large company in Bangladesh, which randomly assigned staff to different schedules. Less than one day in the office, one to two days in the office, and three to five days in the office. And what they found is that Group B performed best, one to two days per week, closer to one day in that group. They had the best work output as measured by managers, greatest satisfaction as measured by surveys, and the strongest social connections, which that one really surprised me. I thought that Group C would have the strongest social connections, but it turned out that Group B just spent their more of their time in the office and socializing and connecting with people. They end up having stronger social connections. Now, Sherm Research, Society for Human Resources, found that 48% of survey respondents said that they will definitely look for a full-time work-from-home job in their next search. And LinkedIn data supports this. So LinkedIn finds that they have something like 13, 14% of their positions are fully remote, but the those positions get over half of the applicants on LinkedIn. To take a full-time job with a 30-minute commute would require respondents to have a 20% pay raise and to work a hybrid schedule of 2.5 days in the office with a 30-minute commute would require them to have a 10% pay raise. So as compensation professionals, this again is showing more data to you when you're thinking about compensation and what you can do with flexibility as a tool of compensation. This is a really important, valuable tool. If you're not integrating this into your toolbox, you are not really using the full range of tools because if you're just using money, you're just losing money. And if you're not using flexibility, it's a very, very useful and key tool. And I work with clients all the time to figure out the best compensation policy that includes flexibility as an important driver of retention and recruitment, which is, of course, what compensation is about. So my clients reduce attrition using several tools. And these are the tools also that help with resistance. So re resistance and attrition are addressed using the same tools. The key here is empathy. Most traditional leaders like Elon Musk don't show empathy. They just believe it's a job requirement to come in. But simply demanding office presence is not wise. It's a great way to lose talented staff. So empathy means really understanding the perspective of employees. They spent the pandemic successfully working mostly from home. And they see a requirement to come in several days a week as a heavy burden. An unfunded mandate that disrupts their lives, costs the money, and exposes them to COVID. There are still some people worried about that. So talk about money and time first. So you're compensation professionals, you know how this works. The average office workers costs, according to research by Owl Labs, financially working from home costs them 432 per month, and that's utilities, office supplies, and so on. Tech, if they have to get some tech. Commuting to work, however, costs them 863 per month. And that doesn't include relocation costs if they move closer to, away from campus. For example, Amazon and AT&T are forcing workers to move closer to campus when they recently announced they're back to work, they're back to the office policy. So this is a difference, the, just the commuting to work without relocation, that's over $5,000 per year. 
over five thousand dollars that's a pretty sizable amount of money yeah. that people are losing and that's just from commuting that's not counting the amount of time that they're spending in traffic and so time is huge the average daily commute is over an hour it's much more in larger areas and so having that commute people value their time right in money and so if you think of an employee who let's say their time is fifty dollars an hour it's so the daily commute one way is over an hour so both ways that's a hundred dollars per day and that's you know 250 dollars of working per per year that's twenty five thousand dollars so if you have someone who is making fifty dollars per hour so that's a huge amount of money and so people and again if some people are going to be more some people less than 25 than fifty dollars an hour so if you're making let's say twenty dollars an hour it would be closer to ten thousand something like that but that is an example of how much people are losing in terms of their time on commuting so this is a high burden a high ask no wonder people are asking for a higher salary salary increases if they're going to be if they are going to be commuting if they're going to be coming to the office because people don't hate the office they hate the commute overwhelmingly speaking and so this is a big problem and challenge so you need to show empathy in your communication. Don't ignore the elephant in the room. Acknowledge the pain points of staff. Show that you recognize the costs of money and time. Share the story of your own challenges. That HR, CHRO who I talked to, I encouraged her to talk about herself. Like she had to relocate back from taking care of her ailing father to move closer to campus. And that was a big challenge for her. So you want to be aware and share the story of your challenges and how you're dealing with challenges in the return to office. So speak about the disruptions to your own life. And of course, offer payments. Your compensation professionals, you understand that, to ameliorate challenges. Pay their commuting costs, IRS mileage rates for driving, parking costs, public transit, their lunch costs, of course, at local restaurants or cater lunch. Pay for their relocation if they need to relocate back to campus, pay for child care and elder care, and salary increases for key staff like Ian Goodfellow, who really, you really don't want to lose. And then address COVID fears. This is still an issue that people are, some of them are still afraid of COVID. So most of my clients encourage all staff to get the bivalent booster shots. And I don't say in any forceful way, but just giving them time off to get shots and the sick leave to recover from side effects, those sorts of things. All right. Now, Thinking about this, let's talk about attrition. How much of a problem do you see that in your workplace? With a mandated return to office. Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds to make your voice heard. Okay, so again, for one fifth not applicable, one fifth not a problem, and then the rest is a moderate problem. So yes, moderate problem, definitely something to be aware of and address. Good. Okay, third horse, quite quitting. This refers, you've heard the phrase, it's employees who psychologically disengage from their work. They do just enough to get by without getting in trouble. And quite quitting, quite frankly, can be worse than the much more obvious resistance or attrition because it's hard to see and it throughout a company's culture from within. And we see the impact of the forced return to office can be quite high. So a report from Gallup Research shows that forcing employees to come to the office leads to disengagement, fear, and distrust, according to Ben Weigest, who's the Gallup Director of Research and Strategy for Workplace Management. In fact, he says, and I'm quoting here, employee, employees experience significantly lower engagement, significantly lower well-being, significantly higher intent to leave, and significantly higher levels of burnout with a mandated return to office when they feel that they shouldn't be coming to the office on the days that they shouldn't be coming to the office. The optimal engagement boost occurs when employees spend 60 to 80% of their time, three to four days in a five-day work week, working off-site. So again, similar to what Harvard Business Review found one to two days in the office, closer to one day. And so that is what I find in my clients is a really good balance. One to two days in the office with this hybrid schedule and employees going into the office on the days that they actually need to get stuff done in the office. 
So a future forum report shows that remote workers compared to fully in office workers are more likely to feel connected to their direct manager, to their company's values, and are equally likely to feel connected to their immediate teams. Workers with full schedule flexibility compared to those with rigid schedules have much higher productivity, 29% and 53% greater ability to focus because they can do the things at home that are best done at home, which is individual head down focused work. And flexible and remote work policy are cited as the number one factor in improving company culture over the past two years. Now, Cisco's survey of 28,000 global employees found that 78% say that remote work improved overall well being, and 79% say that it improved overall work life balance. So, when you're thinking about work life boundaries, well being, stuff like that, clearly having some remote work, substantial remote work, this is not full time remote work, but substantial remote work over half the work week is very good for well being. 51% say it strengthened their friendships. 74% say it strengthened their family relationships. So when you hear, oh, remote work isolates people, that's true for a small slush subset of people who live alone. So people who live alone, yes, that's going to be harder. And especially young people who may not have friendship networks, move to a new town for work, may not have friendship networks. But for people who are living with their family or who have a good friendship circle, that's not the case at all. So it strengthens their friendships, it strengthens family relationships. And so it's probably a wash overall for what kind of impact it has. You want to target, you want to think about the impact of remote work. It's going to have some isolating impacts on certain people, but more socializing impacts on others. 82% say the ability to work from anywhere made them happier. 55% say the ability to work from anywhere decreased their stress levels. So the forced return to office does harm well-being, leads to burnout, contributes to quiet quitting. And I acknowledge that with my clients when they do a forced return to work. We know that. We have to, if we decide that returning to the office is the right move, which the vast majority of my clients decided on my advice, we know that it's going to have some negative impacts on their employees. So we need to ameliorate that. And this is what this whole presentation is about, how to ameliorate the negative impact of the return to office. I'm not giving you this data and saying, you know, therefore you should allow full-time remote work to everyone. Not what I'm saying. And that's not what I tell my clients. Hybrid work seems like the best modality, but you need to know that it comes with costs and you need to know how to address these problems of resistance, attrition, and quiet quitting. So addressing quiet quitting involves several tools. One key tool, the most important thing, is addressing the single biggest source of frustration, which is coming into the office and doing the same thing you do at home with actually a worse meeting experience because you have hybrid meetings. So you want to have in-office experience that avoids this problem. There are only few, a few good reasons to come to the office other than accessing physical resources like lab bench to do research or to, of course, access payroll or for factory workers who need to work on the farm or agricultural workers. Collaboration, socializing, and training. Those are really great reasons to come to the office for office workers. Collaboration, more intense collaboration is better done. Synchronous is better done in the office. Socializing and team bonding better done in the office. Training, mentoring, on-the-job training, all of those things are better done in the office most of the time. And as part of collaboration, nuanced conversations where a leader conveys strategy or you have conflictual conversations, generally better done in the office. But there are a number of things that are better done at home. Individual head down work for most people who have a normal home off work environment, it's better done at home. Asynchronous communication like Trello, like Asana, like Microsoft Teams, like email, like Slack messages, much better done at home. And video conference calls and like this one, webinars and phone calls are much better done at home. So you're not distracting others, you're not distracted by others. So it's, people find it's much, those are much better done at home. And those things take up the 80%, 85%, 75%, depending on the person and their role of a typical of the typical work time of employees. So you can manage to get them scheduled in such a way as to minimize people's commute. That's great. So trying to minimize people's commute, if they will appreciate that and they will see that you're reducing their commuting time. If you can squish that down, especially into one day a week, that's great. Two days, then two days. So squishing that down and they can really see that, that's going to minimize your quiet quitting. 
and facilitate socializing and collaboration when people come to the office. Create fun experiences for staff when they come into the office. As part of the initial office return, if you haven't done that yet, most people already have. So kind of re-engaging with them. Occasional fun experiences are very valuable. Escape room events, other forms of team bonding, really good. And you want to train managers on leading hybrid teams. So the time in the office is focused on collaborative activities. Time at home is focused on actually preparing for these activities and on individual tasks. And invest in training. For demonstrate the investment into professional development, especially for the staff hired during the pandemic, who we do have research that they haven't been onboarded as well, they haven't had as good mentoring, they haven't had as good training. You want to make sure they are integrated and receive the necessary on-the-job training. Of course, don't forget your longer tenured staff. Prepare training events to meet the needs of both groups. Start with training on how to work in a hybrid setting, what to do at home, what to do in the office, and how to collaborate effectively when you're working remotely. And finally, how to have hybrid meetings, which are definitely not the same as typical meetings. Also, improve the office and technology. Redesign offices to be much more collaborative spaces because that's going to be the future of offices, collaboration. The future of offices is not individual work, but the offices are still way too much set up for individual work. And staff will focus on their individual work at home. You want to also update the technology for hybrid meetings. If you have traditional technology for hybrid meetings, that's an awful experience. Remote attendees just end up being second-class citizens or on-site staff dial-in from the cubicle, which kind of negates the benefits of coming to the office. And let's see what you think about quiet quitting. How much of a problem do you think that is in relation to your return to office? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, almost everyone voted. Five more seconds for the ones who didn't. Great. Okay, so we see that it's not a problem for 10%, not applicable for 10%, but it's either a serious problem. So with this seems like the biggest issue so far, the quiet quitting. Over 75% of respondents see this as a serious issue a serious issue or a moderate issue. Good to know and good for you to be aware of the ways to address it. Okay, let's get to the final of the fourth force, loss of diversity, equity, inclusion. So the future forum report showed that 21% of white knowledge workers wanted a full-time return to office. What about black knowledge workers? How many do you think? Just take a second to think of a number. How many black knowledge workers want a full-time return to office? The answer is only 3%, only 3%. And that's not the only study. Sure, Sherm's study found that 50% of all black office workers want to work from home permanently, compared to only 39% of white office workers. Why do we see this difference? Well, unfortunately, black professionals and others who are in certain ethnic minorities still suffer from discrimination and microaggressions at the office and they're less vulnerable to harassment in remote work. So it's no, not a wonder that we see this. And again, similar findings, we see that in other underrepresented groups who see some microaggressions and discrimination. We, for example, see a conference board study that says that 78% of women say workplace flexibility is of key importance to them compared to 61% of men. And that's not simply discrimination and microaggressions. Women, unfortunately, are still have the burden of child care, elder care, home chores. Impact on people with disabilities is especially profound. A study by the Economic Innovation Group using US Census data found that the employment rate fell sharply early in the pandemic for all workers. So by Q2 2022, for people without disabilities, it mostly recovered, not fully. So it fell sharply and then rose to 1.1% below pandemic level. So it didn't quite fully reach the pandemic levels. What about for people with disabilities? So that's people without disabilities. So how, what do you think happened to people with disabilities compared to their employment rate pre-pandemic? Well, it also fell sharply, 
but then it rose above pre-pandemic levels, above pre-pandemic levels, 3.5% above pre-pandemic levels due to remote work was as a major factor. So for example, Thomas Foley, who is the executive director of the National Disability Institute, said that workers with disabilities had been asking for work remotely for decades before the pandemic. And they consistently heard companies just telling them, no, no, no. During the pandemic, according to him, quote, we all realized that many of us could work remotely that was disproportionately positive for people with disabilities, unquote. So long COVID and disability is especially something to think about. 19% of those who had COVID developed long COVID, according to the CDC, and 25% of those with long COVID changed their employment status or working hours. So that's, a, so that's going to be, of all people who had COVID, that's going to be just under 5%. So that's a huge number of people. Long COVID interfered with work for 4 million people, according to a recent study from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And the pandemic increased the number of people with disabilities. So the Federal Reserve Bank of New York found that the number of disabled persons in the US grew by 1.7 million because since the pandemic started. And not everyone with long COVID had it bad enough that they became disabled, but many did, mainly due to long COVID conditions such as fatigue and brain fog. That's the growth of people with disabilities. 800,000 dropped out of the labor force, but 900,000 continued working in large part because of remote work. And long COVID is going to be considered a disability under the ADA. We already saw court cases that cover long COVID, depending on the nature of the condition. Remote work is a reasonable accommodation for those struggling with issues such as fatigue and brain fog, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And again, court cases showing this as well. Diversity inclusion at Meta actually bear these numbers out. So Meta offered full-time remote work, still offers some, but it offered full-time remote work throughout the pandemic. So according to its chief diversity officer, candidates who accepted job offers for remote positions were substantially more likely to come from diverse communities and less flexible companies. And what we found is that Meta actually overachieved in its diversity goals. So in 2019, long before the pandemic, it set a five-year diversity plan. You know how companies do this for achieve this plan five or 2024, five-year diversity plan, and then they usually don't achieve those goals. They say, well, it's, it's we tried, we didn't quite reach those goals, but we did some good stuff. But because it offered full-time remote work, Meta reached its five-year diversity plan goals set in 2019 already by 2022. It doubled Black and Hispanic workers in the U.S., doubled the number of women in its global workforce, and people with disabilities increased from 4.7 to 6.2% of employees. This is huge. How do you address these DI challenges when you're asking for a return to office? You want to have better ERG groups, employee resource groups. Many organizations already have ERGs for women and people of color. Support them better, considering that they will struggle more with a return to office, with spending more time in the office. You often need to establish ERG groups for people with disabilities. Often they don't exist. And this is especially important to do with the return to office, including those with long COVID. And ERG for parents who have an especially difficult challenges with return to office. Offer ADA accommodations, including fully remote work for those with disabilities like brain fog and, and long fatigue associated with long COVID. Also, you want to have in-person mentoring for underrepresented groups. Lack of sponsorship and mentoring is a major, major challenge for underrepresented groups. It's important to provide two mentors for each mentee, one from the majority group and one from the underrepresented group to give access to both kinds of networks and experiences. And you want to have in-person mentoring meetings so that you provide immediate value to the underrepresented mentee for the return to office. Now, thinking about this, how much of a problem is loss of DEI for your workplace in relation to a mandated return to office? Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds for those who haven't yet participated.
Okay, so this seems to be the least problematic issue. So about 25% of folks see this as a moderate problem. Good to know. Now, I want to share with you about someone who implemented these techniques into their organization. And let's see if I can do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. I'm going to play this video. If someone, if you are unable to hear the video, please unmute yourself and let me know. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week. Uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and, and then I saw a video that Leb actually, uh, a video talk that Leb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we change our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, good. So hopefully that was helpful for learning about the impact on an organization that applies these techniques to address the four horsemen of the mandated return to office. Now let's talk about measuring success. So you want to measure success, of course. You want to addressing these four horsemen. You don't want to simply say, oh, we'll, we'll do these interventions. You also want to how measure how successful they are. So there are some traditional and more objective metrics you can use, like retention, an obvious one, especially from underrepresented groups, productivity, and it depends, of course, on the kind of things you can measure, whether it's manager productivity, whether it's if your calls center, the number of calls, length, customer experience, and so number of sales for sales team, number of lines of code written for programmers, performance, and sick days. You also want to do some more survey-based qualitative measurements that are customized to the return to office, including demographic data. Establish a baseline before a return to office of intent to stay, happiness, engagement, well-being, and connection to supervisor, team members, business unit members, and company culture. And if you have already the return to office, you can establish a baseline now before doing some interventions. Then repeat the survey after doing some interventions or after a return to office. Evaluate different business units and have them run deliberate experiments and evaluate the results of what works best. Study the data based on your own internal experience and use the data to change your return to office and reevaluate your results. All right, so let's talk about the key takeaways from the four horsemen of the mandated return to office. Resistance, 
So this is a key element. You have both public resistance and private resistance, non-compliance, and you want to address both. Attrition is also a serious issue, especially. So resistance and attrition, attrition is going to be especially important for you as compensation professionals to address and think about how attrition is a big issue. Quiet quitting is also a big issue and compensation is an element of how to address that and loss of diversity, equity, inclusion. And measure, you want to measure how you address these four problems, improve your plan for addressing them, and then measure again. All right, everyone. And I'll send you some resources after this presentation. So additional resources, if you're watching this as a recording afterward, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. But for those in the call right now, I'll just send, send them to you without a problem. A link to slides and a copy of my best-selling book, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. All right, I'll be happy to take any questions at this stage. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat and either myself or Rose will be happy to read your, your questions in the chat as well. Hi, it's Claudia. Um, not really a question, but more of a comment. I've heard a lot of you know information regarding back to work and you know not being so flexible with remote work. Um, but I've never really, um, no one really talks about the diversity issue in that case. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's important, right? And I'm glad you addressed it because okay, we're going back to work and it's so black and white, right? Like you're going in, you're not, or I'm going to go in, but I'm going to like quiet quit and just do the minimum to get by. But it's it could be a real issue for those communities that um, used to be, are facing difficulties being a minority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. I appreciate it. Five more seconds for anyone who has a question or a comment. Dr. Gleb, I think for me, this is Rose. Um, having seen this and gone through this at my uh, previous workplace, I think one of the major things that we encountered was um, the remote work aspect and the impact to the ADA. Because of COVID, um, because of uh, you know the remote work, I think there was a lot more, there was an increase, a higher increase in accommodations, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and the impact that that has on the company itself, you know, mm -hmm. going from, you know, having somebody in the workstation to now having to do accommodations and the impact that has not only on the ADA, but as leave of absence as well, you know, where yeah. does that, that fall? So for me, it was interesting to see how company, how, how, how our company was trying to accommodate all that, mm -hmm. but also those bigger questions of, you know, where do you draw the line? Where does it become mm, sure. accommodatable at this point and how far mm. can we do this? Yeah, no, that's definitely important to think about. And there are certainly a number of areas where you can have a win-win situation where it's not simply accommodate or not accommodate, but address, like let's say with the ERG groups. So you can have a situation where employees can help themselves if you facilitate the creation of ERG groups for parents who can help each other, watch each other's kids, manage the situation, or people with disabilities who can share resources, tips. So there are also a win-win situations that companies can set up that don't necessarily only have to be either accommodation or not. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I have a couple of questions. So Nyaga asks, do you think the traditional five days a week return in the office will make a full return when it becomes a norm uh, or I, I think it's no question or it will, it will be a hybrid mix. No question it will be a hybrid mix. There are a number of companies which are very much oriented toward hybrid and they are making that a permanent part of their portfolio. They're getting rid of office space. There's no reason for them to go to five days in the office. It's kind of silly to make their employees come to the office when that's not you know, something that is necessary for them or for, the, or for their employees. There are some good reasons to come to the office. Like I mentioned, collaboration, socializing, training, 
but to have people come to the office just to work on their email or send Slack messages or to write reports, which they can do in the comfort of their home, that doesn't make sense. Employees don't want to do it. Companies don't want to make them. And companies are just losing money by having employees occupy office space that they can be doing the same thing from home. Uh, John asks, what about younger generations being brought up in the digital age? So younger generations are an interesting dynamic. We see that younger generations, the people who want to work from home remotely, the largest proportion of generational people, <laughs> the generation of people who want to work from fully remotely is the millennials. It's not the Gen Z, partially because the millennials have better setup and they have still good technology knowledge and they have better home office setups than younger generations. They're also more established in their careers. They have more of a network. And so, whereas with younger generations, the Gen Z, we see that there is more that they have less of a desire to work full-time remotely than the millennials, but they have more of a desire to work hybrid. So if you look at people who are willing to work full-time in the office, the five days a week, the Gen Z come at the least willing to work five days in the office. Well, so I think we see that they know that they can do their work remotely, a large chunk of their work remotely, and they see no point in coming in five days a week in the office. So the future is definitely going to be with a hybrid modality, with, especially with Gen Z. And we know that more and more technology is coming out, which will make it easier for people to coordinate effectively, to communicate effectively, collaborate effectively more when they are outside of each other's presence. So with AI and so on. And so that will also facilitate more remote work. Okay, <clears throat> any other questions real quick before we close out today's meeting? All right, I'm gonna take that as a we are good on questions. Dr. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. I do have a few final announcements that I would like to share with everybody on the call uh, before we all leave for the day. So our final remarks, You, everybody will be receiving a post-event survey. So if you're on the call right now, you will get that. It will have a link for the nominations for the new board members for to be nominated, um, which as I mentioned earlier, right now it's just board president. Um, everybody else is on their two-year term. So it's just the president one that's ready to rotate out. And I'll also have the link again for the logo contest that we talked about earlier in that post-event survey. One thing I do want to mention for the Texas Total Rewards Conference, every year we do very excitedly get a ticket that we can draw to all of our members. And so everybody on the call today is entered into next year's conference for the drawing on that because you guys are all members. You will all be part of that drawing that happens. Usually it'll be about June or July, a um, month or two right before the conference happens. So you know, everybody's on there. The more events that you attend, the more times your name is in there. And then of course we have our drawing for today. So I'm gonna look away from my screen real quick, which is fine because I'm not on video. So there we go on that. But here is our drawing for everybody on the call. And it's gonna be for a $25 gift card. All right, John, congratulations. We will get that to you and uh, you'll be able to, to redeem that on whatever you wish. And to close everything out, uh, I do want to redo the link again, the QR code. Here's the three different logos that we are looking at as our final logos. You can see most of them are fairly similar. There's just small differences. So we'd like to get your opinion and see which way to go as we officially convert into our new title and our new logos for SACA, which is now South Texas Compensation and Benefits Association. And as promised, if you do need the recertification credits for SHRM or HRCI, here are those codes. I'll leave that on the screen for just a minute. And again, Dr. Gleb, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. It was very informative, a great conversation. We had a couple good questions at the end, which really helped to keep us engaged. So thank you so much for that. You're very welcome.
And with that said, have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.